Great. Well, thanks for being here. Good to see so many people. Um, so I'm Dr. Kurzer, Kendon Kurzer. I am uh, the Associate Director of Undergraduate Writing across the curriculum for the University Writing Program. So I provide a lot of um, outreach work with writing experience classes and helping instructors understand how to in, you know, implement writing effectively in their nursing classes and their chemistry classes and all all those kinds of things and so here we're going to be talking about writing abstracts preparing for the undergraduate research conference and so a thanks to my colleague Melissa Bender and Lisa Sperber who have laid the foundation with the work here and I just adapted it so we'll start off talking a little bit about what an abstract is it's a summary of a research study or other original contribution that highlights its major points while concisely describing its scope. And the key here is original contribution. So where a lot of students tend to go wrong when I teach, I teach a lot of upper division STEM writing classes, and so a lot of research papers. And so a lot of students start writing their abstract and they do it first. And they write the abstract as if it's an introduction with a lot of background, kind of literature review content in there. And that's not the focus of this. A good abstract is actually really mostly about the stuff after all that. It's, it's a teeny bit methodology stuff, but it's mostly results and kind of why the results actually matter. It's mainly that original content. And so we're gonna hit that a whole lot. You'll see that a lot come up. But so, so it's generally best practices to start writing the abstract after you have the rest of your presentation or whatever it is put together. Not always doable, though, of course. Uh, usually they're about 150 to 200 words for the undergraduate research conference. It's a firm 200 words. Don't submit anything else for that. It will be cut off beyond 200 words. And then linguistic features, the kinds of words and the kinds of language that you use. Uh, may vary a little bit according to the field and kind of purpose of your project. So we'll talk about those a little bit more. So let's first think a little bit about this. I'm going to make you interact. I know you can either chime up, unmute yourself or in the chat, which I will be able to see here momentarily. Okay, so go ahead and chat. What is the purpose of an abstract? Either share, Feel free to comment, raise your hand. I don't really care. There's not that many of us and I'm not all that formal when it comes to Zoom anyway. Explain your work to someone else who may be unfamiliar. Okay, I like that. I like that. Is it Henna? Jenna? Jenna, Jenna, yeah. <laughs> Never know. Perfect, thank you. Other thoughts, a brief summary about what your research is about, but what's the purpose of it? So, I mean, yeah, it's a summary. Yeah, you're explaining your work, but I guess think about this, who reads them and how are they used? Like what, what, what do we do? Why do we have an abstract here? Well, scholars will read um, like an abstract to see if it's relevant to their research or a student might read it to see if it's relevant to the research, because if your research paper is like 30 pages and your abstract is like irrelevant to someone's research, they're not going to even take the time to take your research. Okay, so so you nailed it, right? Like the whole point of an abstract is to allow an audience to decide if they're actually going to read it or not which makes them kind of high stakes, right? Like if you have a poorly written abstract, people aren't even gonna be engaging with your work. What about for a conference like this? What's the context there? Who's reading them and why? I mean, I guess you could say like your peers are reading them to see which ones they want to go to or which ones are interesting to them because you're all like they're present they're being presented as opposed to like a journal article that you can access at any time at a conference it's like now or never so they're trying to figure out which ones they want to go to yeah yeah so honestly i think for a conference it's perhaps an it's even more high stakes like you just said jenna right that um it, uh, if you're going to get an audience at all you have to have an abstract that's going to actually bring them in and make them want to you know 
listen to your presentation. So they're, they're actually fairly high stakes for something that's, you know, pretty short, can be pretty straightforward in many contexts to write because the audience, you're trying to get an audience invested. You're trying to get them to actually attend and read and all that fun stuff. Questions or reactions there? Okay, so let's talk a little bit about a how. So like we said, they are summaries, um, little mini texts. Although again, the whole point of an abstract is not to summarize the whole thing. It's to really focus in on that original contribution. That's what we wanna see. We wanna make sure that our original contribution is portrayed to the audience so that they get a good sense of that. And like we said there, right? It's a screening device for readers and conference attendees. I'm only going to attend the conference sessions that have abstracts that seem to resonate with me based on my interests, based on my current research, based on things that I want to learn about. And so they really should be well written and clear about, you know, here's what I'm actually going to be talking about so that the attendees actually are interested in going. Same kind of thing with readers, right, for articles, preview, it helps the readers understand what to expect when they actually read the article. And then they're also helpful for indexing, right? So different abstracts are used um, to help editors. Online databases can, can help connect everything. So they're, they're pretty important, kind of high stakes. Um, so for the undergraduate research conference, like we said, it's 150 to 200 word limit. Make sure we're sticking to that. It's a lay audience. People at UC Davis are educated and intelligent people, but they may not really understand your topic, um, which means we have to make sure that we're defining our terms. We're not throwing in jargon and assuming that the audience gets it. Uh, so, so it's kind, it's, it's, it can be challenging to write abstracts well, especially because we're asking a whole lot of you in no more than 200 words. Like they're really challenging to write well. Promissory or preliminary abstracts are acceptable, especially for a conference like this. This basically means you can submit abstracts where you don't have the research or the project done. You will, or you may not. You can even go to the, present the conference and say, hey, this is where we are in this particular project. What do you think? There's no problem, no issues with that. Um, and so you just want to make sure that you're presenting your work not as if it was already done and you're just kind of faking the results, but you're using things like I expect that we'll find or anticipated results include um, to help get at that. And we'll talk more about that momentarily. There's only one abstract submission per person and then I don't need the question mark here. You don't need citations for this conference. For other conferences, you may, and there's nothing wrong necessarily with including citations in abstracts. They just tend to, they, they contribute to wordiness, so you don't need to worry about it here. You're really just focusing in on the main ideas. Some other tips for this context in particular, make sure that you're working with your professor while you're drafting the abstract. You'll want to make sure that you, um, that the professor needs to sign off on it. And so make sure that you're involving the professor at you know, several points during the drafting stage, especially at the end, to say, hey, look, this is what I'm submitting. Do you approve before you actually go through the hassle of doing it? Like I said, avoid technical jargon. You're aiming this for a general audience and defining terms. When you're using an acronym, for example, you'll want to make sure that you're providing the full term prior to referring to it by the acronym. So it would look something just like this ultra low sulfur diesel, and then ULSD in parentheses. A lot of times students do the reverse, but it should be this way, just so you know. Cut excess words. If you find yourself being unsure of how to actually do that, you can always, um, there's something called the paramedic method and Purdue's online writing lab, the OWL has some resources on there that can be really helpful. Um, things like looking at prepositions and, um, uh, empty heads, things that don't actually contain real meaning, but are just there for grammatical structure. And I'd be happy to talk more about that if you're interested, but we'll save that for the end. And then the website has some nice, um, helpful 
tips there too. So refer to those. So what actually gets into the abstract? So I know I said you're focused on your original contribution, but you do need to frame it a little bit. So there'll be a brief, again, brief is the key here, background, introduction, kind of research context. What do we currently know about the topic and why is it important? Um, even though why is it important, you can save that for implications and stuff. So it's, it's but it's, you want this to be really brief. Then you present your research purpose. What is the study about? Um, yeah, we can put that link in. I can do it really quick since I had it there. Oh, not using it. Sorry, one second. All right, there's the link. So you're presenting your research purpose. Uh, what is the study actually about? The methods, materials, subject, procedures, you know, kind of the nitty gritty details. You don't need to include a whole lot of specific details, but at least um, a basic overview is really helpful to help lend your presentation some reliability, right? It says, I actually know what I'm talking about. <laughs> if my materials are, are solid. How was the study or the project done? Results and findings, what was discovered? And again, here, if it's, a, if it's a promissory, if it's anticipatory, you can say, this is what I think we'll find. And then you really want some meat of discussion, implications. Why does this matter? What do the findings mean? And so really in terms of bulk, what, what you want, the majority of your space should be devoted to these last three. And many students tend to devote way too much space to the first one. So just so you know, some other ways to think this, think about this. What did you do? Why did you do it? How did you do it? What have you learned? And what does it mean? What's the so what? And so notice that these questions are really about your particular project. You're not bringing in too much background. So, so it could look something like this, right? I've got basically this background, significant knowledge gaps exist in X topic. In order to fill these gaps, an experiment has been developed to assess. So that's the second point, right? Here's the research purpose. And then in this experimental phase of this ass assessment, I am investigating. Sure, I can go back. So looking at these questions there, are you good now, Jenna? Yeah, thank you. Okay, no worries. Then, so here's the methodology portion of it. And here's what we think we'll find here. And notice this initial finding. So this means that it's, and with this experimental phase stuff, right? This is basically saying, this is pretty preliminary. And people reading this will know that it's preliminary and they'll expect that when they're coming in. So here we've got some results content and then this discussion stuff at the end. Questions about that? Okay. So some other things to consider. What type of background do general readers and other researchers need? This is where some definitions might come in, right? We'll make sure that we're that we're defining our terms and kind of setting up framing the work that we're doing in the abstract. Which verb tenses are used? Are the verbs actually descriptive? This will be a little bit different in different um, disciplines. A lot of STEM contexts still heavily rely on passive voice, whereas other disciplines don't. And even in STEM contexts, passive voice tends to be falling out of favor because it's wordy. It doesn't really con contribute that much. Are there citations or references to previous research? You're not going to be including citations for this one, but you still want to make it clear to the audience that what you're proposing in your abstract is grounded in reality in academic contexts. And so having just some references that, that make it clear that you know what you're talking about is, is important. Does the abstract use I or we? Typically, I recommend that it should, right? You're presenting work that you're actually doing. There's no need to kind of beat around the bush and say the researcher or um, use passive voice exclusively. It's a lot more clearer uh, and concise to use pronouns like this. And so typically, especially for a conference like this, no problem using I or we. And then are you defining 
your acronyms or abbreviations. So keep those things in mind. Some opening strategies. So one strategy could be just simply starting with a real world phenomenon with standard practice, something that is basically common knowledge, -y, at least in your discipline. Things like corporate taxation rates vary around the world or economists have long been interested in X, right? Basically something that just says, hey, this is what we're actually gonna be talking about. This is the topic. Strategy B could be starting with a purpose or an objective. Something like the aim of the study is to examine X. You can kind of jump into it pretty quickly because the whole point of the abstract is to actually highlight your stuff there. Um, and then you might see a little bit of background built into that portion there. Another strategy could be starting with present researcher action. Uh, an example could be we analyze corporate taxation returns before and after the introduction of the new tax rules, right? So basically, again, saying here's what the researchers are actually doing with this study that's represented by the abstract. Starting with a problem or an uncertainty, kind of building back out to this background, this more general background. The relationship between corporate taxation and corporate strategy remains unclear, right? So it's just something a little bit more general, but it's still pretty brief. And then you move straight into your particular project. So summarize those kinds of things. Think about what you did, why did you do it, how did you do it, what have you learned, and what does that mean, and get into that. So now we're going to apply it. I have a handout that I've got the link for Google Doc. Um, yeah, just a second. Let me copy this into the Google, this Google Doc into the chat, and then I'll bring that back up. So um, for this, I've got several um, several abstracts from previous conferences here. You you shouldn't you won't be able to edit it, but you can copy and paste out the content into a new document. And what I'd like you to do is basically identify the different stuff in those. And so I'll go back to that slide in just a second, Justin. Um, but so in the meantime, pick one of them. We've got one about um, biodiesel. We've got an art history one about a Monet painting. We've got one about BPA. And then we've got one about Latina students in higher education contexts. And so pick one that seems most interesting to you um, or mo resonates most in terms of your particular program. And then look at highlighting the background, the present research for purpose, the materials, methods, subjects, procedures, results and findings and discussions. Um, sound good? And then, so I'll bring it back up. I'll bring up what to do here in a minute. So this is the strategy A, starting with a real world phenomenon. Are you good, Justin? Yep, no worries. Okay, so back to this. Go ahead and we'll take about four minutes to let you look through yours and then we'll talk about them, okay? Can you go to strategy B? Yep. Thank you so much. No worries. Perfect. I know I hit through those pretty quickly. So again, you're just you're highlighting in different colors the background, the present research, purpose, the methods, material subjects, the results and findings, and the discussion conclusions, implications, content in one of the sample abstracts that I sent to you or that I shared with you.
another minute or so. Once you're finished, if you want to give me a heads up, thumbs up, or drop in the chat. So Jenna's done. Matthew's done. Another minute still. Just in time. Okay, why don't we start talking about them? Make sure we can get through that okay. Um, did anybody do this one, the biodiesel one? Give me a raise your hand if you did. No one? Okay, this is kind of a fun one. I'll walk you through this one. So this is what I indicated. So I saw this first sentence as being background. Um, the second sentence is really showing in order to fill these gaps, right? We're basically saying this is the experiment that we're doing. Um, and then we've got methodologies section here. It's fairly extensive, but not overly long. Uh, and then we've got initial findings here. So this is a nice one to show kind of this preliminary abstract approach. And then it ends with, this is why this is the most important. This is why this is important. I mean, it could be a little bit more clear, right? Like what it, what exactly does this matter? But I'm nitpicking because um, that's what I do in my classes. So this one's pretty well balanced, right? There's not an overly large chunk of background. It's mainly, like we said, it's mainly focusing on, you know, points three, four, and five. And so this isn't too, this isn't too shabby. This isn't too shabby. Did anybody do the, the art history one? Yeah, this is the one that I did. Okay, do you wanna walk us through what you found? Yeah, Jennifer? so I was kind of a bit confused. I really actually liked this abstract. I think um, the background and influence is starting with um, painted during and after World War I. These paintings were donated to the French government by Monet uh -huh. himself all the way up until um, Horrors of War. I thought was like the background and context and then the research and purpose um i didn't really i i honestly could be completely wrong i didn't really find that but i also think i um mixed that one up with the um results and findings which is okay. when the author says um monet or the painter was well aware of his increasing age and then all the way until the end of the thing which is patriotic I didn't really find any, I mean, I also thought the results findings and discussion conclusion were very similar in this abstract, mm -hmm. but I didn't really find any methods, materials, or subject procedures. So I kind of think two, four, and five were just done in this, completely done in the second half of the abstract. Yeah, so this one, I think is it's it's an interesting one, which is why I like it. I mean, it, it's also discipline specific, right? So an art history one is, it's not going to be as research focused because it's not like there's a research project presented perhaps but there still should be some kind of original something and i think you're absolutely right that this one's a challenging one to see because a lot of it just doesn't exist this is actually how i'd classify it 
all of this first part is really just background about the painting and why it's important. With art history, I mean, you're going to get some more of that because like, like I said, there's not like you're conducting an experiment. You're just presenting a new kind of original perspective or paradigm regarding the artwork in this case. But, and so, so it, it, it might have a little bit more background than in other contexts, but I would argue that this is excessive, right? That you could cut this introduction down by half, even by two thirds, and it would still be effective. And you'd actually be more effective as, as far as an abstract by really building these later parts. Like, why does this matter? What, like, yes, it's interesting that the paint the, the paintings were an intensely personal project rather than patriotic but what are you actually going to be telling us about that that's new that's original and so really for me where this one comes up short is the fact that it doesn't do nearly enough to actually say here's why this matters here's my new original contribution that's going to bring somebody in does that make sense yeah it does that's kind of what I was thinking too. I just, I didn't really know if that was in, indeed correct. You're right on, you're right on. Now, I will say all that and still say that I got this abstract from the website. This was an accepted abstract, right? So keep in mind kind of the level of what we're expecting. You turn in an abstract and as long as it's reasonably, you know, your students, we're expecting student work with a conference like this. Um, just be aware that if you're turning in something like this, it'll be a lot harder for the audience to really feel like they're invested in attending your session. I would suspect that that a, that a session like this, unless you've got somebody who's really, really obsessed with Monet's work and is like, I go to anything possible, you're not going to see the attendance that you might like. Comments or questions about this one? Actually, I don't want to um, go against what you said, but I actually kind of liked the abstract only because I mean, it may be that I'm more letters and science oriented. So like, this is kind of like up my alley, but I actually, I, I do think there are definitely some issues with it, particularly the fact that the entire blue is half the abstract. I do think that like, that's a lot. Um, I, I just, I like, I wish I would have seen a bit more of the yellow and green. Cause I really think that's the most interesting part of like what, the abstract is about but I do think it's it's really interesting I just wish there was a little bit more of like what they had found yeah um, no I, I mean I absolutely agree I think the topic's certainly interesting and I think it's it's clear like it's well written and they clearly devoted a lot of effort to it just because it missed that the original contribution just isn't explicitly discussed enough to make me feel like I'm confident spending time in a session like this is going to result in me getting some new insights I would just suspect with something like this that the presentation could basically equal that, that there would be, you know, 65% of it would be this background stuff rather than the meat of what we want to see being that original stuff. Does that make sense? I guess I have a, a follow-up question to that. If you're doing sure. an abstract and you assume that your audience doesn't know anything about your topic, how much background then should you give, even if you're presenting or have a poster? Like if that's the case in an abstract if you're if you're doing something like sciencey related or even a letters in science like how do you balance the background and then the actual work it's really tough honestly it really is tough abstracts are frankly kind of impossible to perfect <laughs> you can't there isn't such a thing as a perfect abstract because the space limitations just don't allow it what i would say is think critically and really deliberately about the balance um you want to, like I said, I mean, in an so an academic audience, like you'd see at the undergraduate research conference at UC Davis, right? We're academically minded. And so we're really interested with what's cutting edge. I tend to think of this as in terms of kind of a, a pyramid. There's all the research that's ever been done on a particular topic. And you've got the foundation, the biggest piece, there's dozens of different studies, and they're 20 or 30 years old, that lay this foundation, and it's important stuff, but it's not super crucial right now. And as it gets, as you build the pyramid, you've got more and more current things, and this little piece at the top is the stuff that's super current, 
It's forward thinking. It's the original stuff that, and that's the stuff that people really want to see. And so if you're relying on all the stuff underneath it too much, then it's gonna feel like a Wikipedia article where it's just, it's, it's basic stuff that is assumed to be the case. Does that make sense? Yeah, actually the pyramid method is, is a really good point. Thank you so much. Okay, okay. So, so you want, and so just thinking about the audience here, they're gonna be really interested in that peak part. And so you want to provide enough stuff from the bottom that's saying, look, I'm, I'm building this pyramid on a foundation that's legit, but you do it kind of really, really concisely and tightly so that you're not detracting from the other part. But like I said, it's really tough. It's frankly impossible <laughs> to do, to do really well. Um, so don't be overly harsh on yourself. Just think about trying to get the balance that's like this. The balance that's more like this is going to, there's still this kind of foundation, it's there, it's just not detracting from the from the more important stuff. You've got to prioritize with abstracts. Other questions there? Okay. Anybody look at the BPA one? Uh, yeah, I did. Do you mind telling us a little bit about what you what you found? Um, yeah, sure. <clears throat> um, so. This one, I mean, in general, like based on what I was reading, it seems like they also haven't done the, like carried out their study. So I, um, so I found that there was like, um, a little bit more background than I guess what, like what you said would they would typically want to see. So I got from, obviously from the beginning to um, the sentence substantial adverse effects in fetal growth um, to the end of that sentence. That was where I found the background ended. Okay. And then. <clears throat> the next section um i got from uh the next sentence up until um actually yeah just that sentence that really long sentence to low exposure yes. levels yep it's a long sentence yeah um and then for the methods and materials i got um just again the next sentence mm -hmm. and then for the um i forgot what the next section was for uh, results and findings. Since they, it seems like they don't have actual results, I haven't done it yet. Um, right. Just a really short uh, sentence we are interested in. Um, and then I just got that the final sentence was the um, the discussion and talking about and the implications of what their findings could possibly come out to be. Okay. Yeah, I would. I would agree. I would agree largely. Um, yeah, so I think I think like you said, Justin, I think it's a little a little background heavy. Um, and it would be nice. Yes, it is a preliminary one. So we certainly understand why um, there's not more here, but it would be nice to at least allude to some additional stuff that again, looking at that peak of that pyramid, that's the stuff that's going to bring people in. But yeah, solid. Could be a little stronger, but again, really solid. Questions or comments about this one? Yeah, thank you, Justin. And who looked at the Latina students in higher education? Or I did. Are you comfortable walking us through what you found? Um, sure. So I felt that the first two sentences were kind of like the background and introduction about like Latina, Latinas in higher education and like their composition throughout like different systems. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, the, about the study was the third sentence. So the study examines the social, cultural, as well as economic challenges that they face. Okay. And then the study was done um by interviewing i think it was 10 women so they explained that in the next sentence um and then lastly what was discovered it's not like super explicit but they do mention like um three factors that they feel take a big part of their um decision making when they decide to go to college and this the, part here yeah 
yeah, with the location and the interdependence with family. And then lastly, the last sentence doesn't really go into what the findings mean, but I think it's still like a conclusion sentence um, because they hope, I think that the reader will like read the rest of the paper to see yeah. like, why like those reasons are important. Yeah, yeah. So this is a fairly common abstract kind of framework here at the end. We're ending with, we're going to talk about why this matters, <laughs> right? And yeah, that's a lot to bring in. And so, yeah, I think you hit it right on the head. Um, let's see, this to Juliana. So yeah, yeah. Um, I might recommend being a little bit more concise with this part here, if at all possible, just to allow a little teensy bit more development of that stuff at the end. But yeah, otherwise, I think it's a really well written abstract that provides some, you know, there's some specific details in there that tell you exactly what they did and what they found and why it matters. So yeah, any questions or comments about that one? Okay, so there's the, the link again, which is in the chat too. But so we've got a couple of minutes. We've got about 12 minutes. Do I'm happy to, if you any of you happen to have an abstract started that you'd like us to look at, we could certainly do something like that. Or we could talk through some possibilities. If you're like, I've got something more basic. Um, how do you want to proceed? When we meet in person, this is where I have you actually bring out stuff and we actually, I circulate and we talk about how to make it tighter. But I don't know where you are in the research process. If we wanted to contact you later. Would that be a thing we could do once we have a more formalized abstract? It certainly could be. Your first step should be with your professor, just because they're the ones that actually have to approve it. <laughs> Um, uh, so, so I would contact them, make sure that you're getting the help there like you need, but then I'd be happy to provide some additional, I mean, honestly, your professors have been doing these for years, so there, you'll probably get the help that you need there, but I'd be happy to look at something after that. Thank you. So, yeah, I'd like to stress the point that, um, Dr. Cruiser just mentioned, uh, for our conference specifically, the only reason why a student would be turned away is if we reach capacity and we don't have any more room to take students, or if a faculty member rejects the abstract. And if a faculty rejects the abstract, the number one reason why a faculty member will reject an abstract is because the student did not check in with them first uh, to review the abstract. So them seeing it through a submission is the first time they're seeing it. If your abstract does get rejected as part of our conference, what happens is your abstract will go back into the save status and then you as the student will be able to log back in and make the adjustments that your faculty sponsor wants you to make, hit resubmit, and then your faculty member will be able to re-approve, re-review and approve your abstract. So, don't be alarmed if you get rejected. If you do get rejected, check in with your faculty member first and talk to them and then make the adjustments needed and resubmit. And we can always help you through that process as well. Let's see, how can we try to prevent getting rejected due to space? Is it based on the date of approval? Very good question. This year, since we are returning to an in-campus, I mean, sorry, an in-person conference, we are gonna have space limitations because of requirements per COVID, you know, the university COVID policy. So uh, getting rejected due to space, if you wanna guarantee your spot into our conference in terms of space, be sure to apply by the priority deadline to conference, which is February 9th at 1159 PM. If you apply by February 9th, you are guaranteed a spot in our conference. If we reach the final deadline is February 16th, but if we reach capacity prior to February 16th, we will close a registration once we reach capacity um, or uh, if once February 16th passes, whichever comes first. Does it only need to be approved by the PI or those faculty members involved? When you register for the conference, you will be asked to input your faculty sponsor's information. 
your abstract review will go to that faculty member for review. If you have more than one faculty sponsor, please check in with your faculty sponsors to see who you would like, who needs to be listed because you only are going to be able to list one faculty sponsor. Is there ever an opportunity to edit the abstract after it's submitted? Great question, Claire. So after it is submitted, the only way to uh, edit your abstract is for it to be rejected by your faculty member. And so if there is edits that need to be done after it's been approved, let's say you submitted a promissory uh, abstract and now you have a more specific abstract, we can replace that for you manually. Um, it just really depends on the time in which you make that request, because if it's closer to conference, then it's probably not going to happen because we're going to get our abstract books already published and all that good stuff. So the sooner, the better. Uh, can you submit multiple abstracts? We are planning for an in-person conference and due to space capacity and to give everyone a fair chance to get a spot in our conference. Uh, we are not allowing students to submit more than one abstract. However, if we do have to pivot to an online conference, we may be able to allow students to submit, you know, to present more than once because online our capacity issues don't exist. Juliana, no, you certainly don't have to have the findings ready when you're writing the abstract. You can write a preliminary and that's where you would basically just say, here's what I expect we would find. And just make sure it's clear. I sometimes have students who try to, like, they're not trying to falsify the results or anything. They just think it's better to present research as if it's already been done, even if they haven't done it. And don't do that. Just make it clear that it's, this is what we expect to find. And here's why we think it'll matter if that's what we do find. That is actually very, very common to present research that way. Even faculty do it now. Um, it's very common to present research that way. So um, you would be following the practices in, in the academy the same way. So yeah, absolutely true. I've done it several times, right? I mean, it happens all the time. And it's actually really nice to present something that's in progress to a bunch of people because then they're like, yeah, here's what you need to think of that you didn't. <laughs> and like, did you consider this? Oh, I did not. That's a really good idea. Let's build that into the study a little bit more. So yeah, it's absolutely acceptable. Other questions? We have a, we do need to have a, no, I mean, you don't, nobody is going to be like, oh, you didn't, you're presenting something that you didn't have findings for yet. No, it's, I mean, it's certainly acceptable. It's kind of nice to have at least something preliminary, even, even if you're just, even if you're just saying this is a really rough analysis of my interview data. I've only done three interviews, but here's some stuff that we're actually finding now that's kind of nice. But again, nobody's going to be like, where are your results? Just expect at that point, you would expect it's more, a lot more about presenting the work in process and talking about the methodology in more detail um, and then really trying to get feedback on what you're doing and see about if the audience has ways to strengthen it while you're working on the project. Can I use my mic to, it was going to take a while for me to take this out. Please. Okay. Um. So for my abstract, I'm think I, I have like a basic like methodology, but I'm thinking that I might want to like add more stuff that I look at. So is it necessary for me to have it in the abstract for me to like talk about it during the conference? No, I mean, it's pretty common too to have things shift and adjust between the abstract submission time and what you actually present on. Um. I mean, I think in those in those instances where I've done something like that, I'll frequently preface my presentation with, while this is what my abstract said, this is where things ended up going and why I made these changes at the beginning of the presentation, just so the audience doesn't feel duped. <laughs> you can be like, okay, if, 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 if I brought you here under false pretenses, go to something else that you're more interested in. 
Um, but things evolve all the time and researchers understand that. So Thank do you. your best with what you have now and then it'll be totally okay to adjust. Good question. Other questions? That's a good question. E, I don't know if you've done that in the past. No, bring it on. Yeah, no, don't be sorry for the questions. That's what we're here for. So we, um, you know, as long as you're okay with it, Kendon, we will post um, PowerPoint slides and recordings for these presentations. At the very least, we will uh, post the recording and then we leave it up to the presenter on whether they're comfortable with us submitting uh, slides. Yeah, email me and I'll send you a PDF of them at least. So perfect. Yeah, it's a good opportunity getting some good research experience in. That's really nice, especially if you're looking at grad school. Um, I regularly tell my undergrads one of the main things that people are looking for and at the graduate admission side is students who have research experience because it means that they need to be handheld a lot less <laughs> through graduate research. So that's that's a really good thing to do is to get something and some presentation research writing experience that that's that's really valuable. Anything else? We we'll definitely want to thank you, Kendon, for always being a partner in these workshops. Um, our students always get a lot out of these workshops, whether they're presenting at our conference or presenting at another conference. So thank you for your um, continued uh, partnership on this. And for the drop in, Eva, uh, we are working on scheduling those um, this quarter. So we will check back to our website for that. So I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.